Should teenagers 15 and older be able to get a COVID vaccine without even talking to their parents first? Oregon law says yes, but Yamhill County says no. I'm a parent of three teenagers. This is a huge concern. But let's take a look at what other medical care teens can get without parental permission. And let's check in on the latest workplace harassment investigation at the Oregon legislature. This time around, it involves one lawmaker accusing another lawmaker of a... Quid pro quo. Quid pro quo. Quid pro quo. And if you've forgotten what that phrase means since it was last part of our lexicon, don't worry, we'll explain. Here's the story. Oh, it's raining. We're making it rain tonight. I'm Dan Haggerty. Hello, welcome to the story. Don't forget, all the ways at the bottom of your screen. We want to know what's on your mind. Use the hashtag. Hey, Dan, there's no time for this. There's no time for these introductions because tonight we have breaking news. Roll the stinger. Roll the... Why do we never, never have that stinger ready? It doesn't matter. Governor Kate Brown has just announced a COVID lottery. How about that? So for everyone not enticed by the vaccine's COVID repelling, life-saving success derived from the culmination of generations of scientific discovery, how about instead your chance at a million dollars? Let's bring in Pat Doris, okay? I'm very excited to talk to him about this. All these details have not been released yet, okay? We, we got kind of a, a basic announcement, but Pat has more information from one or more unnamed sources, which is just a super cool journalist kind of thing to do, Pat. Tell me, what do we know? Well, Dan, first off, the governor has not announced this. What tipped us off was that uh, the governor has announced a news conference for tomorrow and said someone from the lottery would be there. And we're like, lottery? What do they have to do with, the oh my gosh, the lottery? So this is going on in states all around the country. And uh, we started digging on it. And my information is that Oregon statewide will offer jackpots of at least a million dollars. It's unclear how often those would be offered. They would be given at random to people who have already been vaccinated. So uh, it's an incentive for people to get the vaccine. And then in addition to those big statewide jackpots, which could be higher, but I'm told at least a million dollars, there will also be jackpots in every single county to try and incentivize people there because, you know, Portland, the greater Portland area has all the population and you don't want someone in Burns saying, well, I'm never going to win that thing because all those guys in Portland will get it. But no, in uh, Harney County and Malheur County, all that I'm told, they will each have their own smaller individual jackpots as well. Now, a lot of states have different types of incentives. We've seen the free beer things going on. We've seen states like West Virginia giving away savings bonds to younger, younger people who are like 15 to 17 years old. Is there anything else aside from this one million dollars that is planned or is, is that the big the big giveaway? I think that's going to be the big giveaway, but, it, you know, it could be multiple jackpots over time of this uh, million dollars, which, you know, is pretty significant in my household. When I was telling them what I had just learned, they're like, wow, that's a pretty good incentive to get a shot. I also should say, though, I've been researching this over the last hour or so, and there are scientific reports from people like the Kaiser Family Foundation that says, you know, a really good incentive would be to give people time off to get the shot and recover from the shot. Um, but in the meantime, I guess if you win a million bucks, maybe you could take a little time off. Yeah, I get a little vacation. We know that this this kind of million dollar idea started in Ohio and it, it became kind of national news. Wow, Ohio is going to give away a million dollars to people who are vaccinated. But do we know, does this incentive actually work? Because the state is trying to get to 70 percent. We've kind of stagnated around 60 percent right now before fully reopening at that magic number of 70. Is this going to help us get there? Has it shown to help in, in places like Ohio? Well, the short, honest answer is I don't know. It's relatively new in a lot of these areas, and uh, I'm sure that it does incentivize some people. In Oregon, lottery games are very popular, and a lot of people like to, you know, roll the dice and hope that they're going to win some, uh, some money. So I think kind of the part of the thinking might be, look, you could spend a couple of million dollars on an ad campaign, or you could do something that we know has immediate effect right now. People love being able to be in a drawing, randomly generated numbers, and, uh, and win money. So I think they're going to throw a lot of different things at this, trying to get to that 70%, and this is going to be one of them. Pat, thank you so much. We don't get a lot of breaking news here on the story. This was great. Thank you, sir. Now let's get to the big story. Man, exciting news to start. So let's talk for a moment. I have a question for you. How do you parent your kids? You know, teenagers, 15, 16, 17, living under your roof. I mean, those are tough years. 
older teenage kids. What kind of parent are you? Are you strict? No phones at the dinner table kind of people? Or are you the, if you're going to drink, do it where I can keep my eyes on you kind of folks? I know what you're thinking. Dan, that's none of your business. Get back to the news. There are few things more personal than how you raise your children, and parents typically don't like to be told what is best for their child, even if it's a life-saving vaccine. Right now, if your 15-year-old wants a COVID shot, the state of Oregon doesn't think you, the parents, need to have a say in that, while commissioners in Yamhill County disagree and a direct challenge to state law. Tim Gordon reports. There are only three Yamhill County commissioners, and two of three just voted to require parental consent for any county-affiliated vaccinations of teens 17 and under. Even before Thursday's board meeting, Commission Chair Mary Starrett convinced the County Health and Human Services Director to require the consent. The director initially went along, but then reversed course, now saying it's not a good decision, legally or for teenagers. I, w I just want to clarify, my concern has, has always been there related to the request. Um, and I don't have much else to share with you other than I made a mistake. And I really worked hard to rectify that and make sure that my position on this was clear. And I, I hope that I've been able to do that. Dr. Lindsay Manfred suggested postponing the vote to allow for a thorough review of the consent issue. Commissioner Lindsay Bershauer thinks COVID vaccines are what need more review. I'm a parent of three teenagers. This is a huge concern, and the concern is not that a 15-year-old or a 16-year-old or a 17-year-old has the power of medical consent in Oregon. It's that this particular vaccine is not FDA approved. Bershauer and Sterrett's argument to require parental consent seem to hinge in large part on their extreme views about COVID vaccine safety. Let's take a look at the ingredients. I've got one here that talks about chimpanzee DNA, and that's in one of the vaccines. Fetal stem cells, that's in one of the vaccines. There's a whole host of other ingredients you wouldn't drink, much less inject into yourself, and we're asking a child to make these considerations. It's important to note, Sterrett's comments about vaccine ingredients have been debunked as untrue. The vaccines are approved under federal emergency use authorization and deemed safe safe and highly effective by the vast majority of the scientific community. And again, state law allows teenagers 15 and older to decide for themselves about getting vaccinated. Commissioner Casey Kula wanted to keep it that way, so the potentially illegal move could be studied, but he lost the vote. So commissioners voted two to one to require staff to get parental consent and also for a resolution uh, recommending awareness about the risks of COVID vaccinations. And by the way, they're not the only ones to do this. Lynn County did something similar just last week. Tim Gordon, KGW News. It is an interesting topic. Thank you to Tim. Now we wanted to give you some context here and look in to some other kinds of medical care that kids can get without asking mom or dad, without their parents even being involved. Because as a parent, I gotta say, when I heard this, it, it really did make me think. You know, kids who are under 18, aren't allowed to vote, they can't drink alcohol, can't gamble, get a tattoo, serve in the military, consent to sex, or live independently in most cases. In Oregon, kids under 18 aren't even allowed to go to the tanning bed unless mom or dad says it's okay. But as it turns out, kids do have some control over their own medical care. In Oregon, a kid who is 15 or older can get vaccinated, but they can also get treatment for illnesses or injuries, get a annual physical exam, get x-rays or go to the ER. They can get dental care and vision care without their parents coming along. Same goes for some mental health care and addiction treatment. They can get birth control and abortions and treatment for STDs and transgender teens can get health care to support their gender identity. All of this without mom or dad being involved. And in Washington, the age of medical consent for many procedures is as young as 13. Now keep in mind, medical care isn't cheap, right? And that babysitting money doesn't go very far. So if a teen does try to use their parents' insurance to pay for health care, well then parents will be notified about that and brought into the discussion. And there are certain cases that doctors are required to report, like if a teen's life is at risk or if there's some evidence of abuse. We know that teenagers and their parents have different opinions on what is right for their body. Some parents might not want to vaccinate their kids when they're young, but then those kids get older and they want that protection. Or they have different beliefs about gender identity or sex or mental health. And some parents just never get around to taking their kids to the doctor for any number of reasons. 
The National Alliance to Advance Adolescent Health says that it's great when kids and their parents are on the same page with this type of stuff, but that letting kids make their own decisions about their bodies and their health care is an important part of becoming an adult. And in Oregon, state law agrees. All right, let's count some vaccines. We like to do that every night, don't we? More than 2.11 million Oregonians have gotten at least their first dose, and that puts us at more than 60% of the state's population who is 16 and older with at least one shot. In Washington, more than 3.63 million have gotten at least their first dose of a vaccine, which works out to be about 59% of the state's population who is 16 and older. Both states are trying to hit 70% of that population in order to fully reopen. Now, I want to start this next segment with our quote of the day. Several witnesses advise me that the respondent is not a good texter. That from Portland attorney Sarah Ryan in her report on the investigation into the latest sexual harassment claim at the Oregon State Capitol. So the story goes like this. Representative Vicki Breeze Iverson, a Republican, needed votes to move some legislation forward. So she texted across the aisle to Democrat Brad Witt. Witt is apparently the bad texter, with the report saying he is often multitasking when he texts and his intentions are sometimes hard to determine. So let's take a look at his bad texting and you be the judge. On April 12th, Breeze, Breeze Iverson texted Witt for his support on the bill, but he declined. So she pushed the issue and he responded with this text. We probably need to go for a beer sometime. According to the report, she never addressed that comment and responded by further explaining the bill, to which he replied, I'm not wedded to a beer by any means. Could be dinner or question mark. Breeze Iverson texted back, or what? To which Witt wrote, I've made two offerings. If you want to meet, find something better than dinner or a beer. Okay, I'm with you. He is absolutely terrible at texting. I mean, that is an awkward read. No matter how you read it, there's no doubt about that. But what is in doubt is the intent of that terrible text. Vicki Breeze Iverson thinks it was a quid pro quo, a Latin phrase that essentially means a favor for a favor. Most recently made famous by local entrepreneur turned former ambassador to the EU who E2 brutade the president with that phrase during the Ukraine scandal. And yes, that is all the Latin I know in toto. In this case, though, Breeze Iverson insists the terrible texts were most definitely a quid pro quo, a vote for her bill in exchange for sex. She sent us a statement saying, in part, women deserve to be treated fairly and equally. We should not be subjected to unwanted, suggestive text messages. Rep. Witt knows what he did. Though, according to the investigation and the 15-page report published yesterday, he did not. The report says while Breeze Iverson was not unreasonable in her interpretation of his text messages, the investigator doesn't believe it was a quid pro quo, saying there was actually some evidence that Witt had already had some concerns about their working relationship and had been trying to schedule a meeting to try and improve it, which is ironic considering now the two of them have been directed to have zero contact with each other. Rep. Witt told us in a statement, in part, I'm gratified that the investigation dealt with the facts at hand and came to a conclusion on that basis. I'm looking forward to the final resolution to this matter, which will happen on June 1st. The House Committee on Conduct will discuss the situation, the report, and what to do next. For almost a century in Oregon, people could be convicted of a crime by a jury that wasn't unanimous. Now that's been declared unconstitutional, and there's hundreds of cases kind of in limbo. There's still no guarantee that these folks are going to have their day in court, their opportunity to have a fair constitutional trial. When the story continues.
Welcome back. I was just going through some of your tweets and your emails during the break. A lot of questions about that vaccine lottery, that one million bucks. A lot of questions. I just have one. How am I going to spend my winnings? I'm not sure yet. I'll let you know. Also, I wanted to remind everyone about our new Hey Help campaign to give back to the community. We're very excited about this. All this week, we are asking you to consider donating to Solve to help support the work they do to clean up trash, not just in Portland, but in the entire state of Oregon. It really helps our environment and helps things look a lot nicer. Open up the camera on your phone, point it at the QR code right now on your screen. That'll take you to a donation link. We're calling this a micro donation drive. That means that you don't have to give a big amount of money. Feel free to give any amount of money, no matter how small, whatever you can give or what you feel comfortable giving. Each week, we are going to highlight a different cause for one of these micro donation campaigns. So if you know of a nonprofit or an organization in need, please let us know with the hashtag HeyDan or email the story at KGW.com. Oregon's definitely had a lot of firsts throughout history. All right, we were the first state to pass the bottle bill, the first state to decriminalize marijuana, the first state to vote entirely by mail. We've been a leader for a lot of progressive causes, except for one, non-unanimous jury convictions. Because Oregon was the last state in the country to get rid of them. And that's only because of a U.S. Supreme Court ruling from last year. You might remember this. If you haven't heard of it, you're probably going to go, really? Uh, Okay. Oregon allowed people to be convicted of a crime, even if everyone on the jury didn't agree about it. As long as 10 out of 12 jurors decided you were guilty, then you could be legally convicted of that crime. Well, last April, the Supreme Court put a stop to that. And again, Oregon was the only state in the country left with this law. So it really only applied to us. So now, no one in Oregon can be convicted by one of these non-unanimous juries. But what about everyone in prison right now? People who were put there by a split jury. Do their convictions get thrown out? Well, that's a pretty good question, right? And one the Supreme Court also took up this week. They ruled that last year's decision on non-unanimous juries isn't retroactive. And what that means is is that anyone in prison on one of these non-unanimous convictions is staying there in prison, at least for now. They're letting the states instead decide if they want to throw out all of those old cases. And people can still appeal their convictions too, but it's gonna be up to the states. I talked to Lewis and Clark Law Professor Elisa Kaplan about all of this. She's the director of the Criminal Justice Reform Clinic, which has advocated for people sentenced by non-unanimous juries. Can you tell me how many people are in prison in Oregon and were put there because of non-unanimous juries? And I cannot give you an exact number because for more than the 85 years that we had non-unanimous juries here in Oregon, we had no mechanism to count them or to ensure that we even knew if people had non-unanimous juries. Um, The only way we know if people had non-unanimous juries over the years is if their lawyer or for some reason the judge asked for the jury to be polled and then put it on the record or wrote it in a, um, in a, you know, on the verdict sheet. And so there are tons of people likely that were imprisoned in Oregon that had a non-unanimous jury and they didn't even know. Um, where we are right now is there are somewhere between 220 and about 300 people who have filed claims saying they have proof that they had a non-unanimous jury. And it, and the majority of those people are in prison. The attorney general is in a position in all these cases to either stipulate to retroactivity in all these cases, or she could just not fight the arguments. Um, she could stand down um, and allow the cases to proceed and let the courts figure it out and let them figure it out quicker. This is not a get out of prison free uh, you know, ask. This is all I want is a fair trial, and I want to go back to the beginning. Now, she mentioned the attorney general there, Ellen Rosenblum. She hasn't been exactly a fan of this whole unconstitutional ruling. In fact, last year, she asked the Supreme Court to keep the non-unanimous jury law the way it was. But this week, she did release a statement saying, my office remains committed to reviewing every case presented to us that involves a request for a new trial. We are carefully reviewing the Edwards decision, and we will be working 
expeditiously on a plan for addressing these cases going forward. She also said the legislature could pass a law to fix this whole thing and throw out all of those non-unanimous convictions. So that is an option moving forward. Also, a third option is for the state Supreme Court to rule that those cases need to be thrown out and get new trials. A lot of critics say Oregon's non-unanimous jury law was a holdover from Jim Crow era racism. So how did we get here? Well, we've got to go all the way back to 1933, when a Jewish man named Jacob Silverman faced murder charges in Oregon. Eleven jurors were ready to convict, but one wasn't. So as a kind of compromise, they convicted Silverman of manslaughter instead of murder, and he was sentenced to three years in prison. A lot of people thought that his sentence was too light, including the editorial board of The Morning Oregonian. In November 1933, they published a, frankly, racist editorial. They wrote, this newspaper's opinion is that the increased urbanization of American life and the vast immigration into America from Southern and Eastern Europe of people untrained in the jury system have combined to make the jury of 12 increasingly unwieldy and unsatisfactory. Oregon lawmakers heard the outrage and a special election was held a year later in 1934. Voters approved a change in the Constitution, making it so only 10 out of 12 were needed to convict somebody, except in cases of first-degree murder charges. That still needed to be unanimous. Supporters framed it as a way of reducing congestion in the courts and saving tax dollars. Fast forward to 2020, and the U.S. Supreme Court ruled non-unanimous jury convictions unconstitutional. And they were talking to us, because at the time, Oregon was the only state in the country where these convictions were still allowed. And that's how we got here. Now, we've been talking a lot about school board races lately. It's kind of it's kind of become our thing here on the story. And I do want to focus on the results from some of the Portland races right now, because the school board for the state's largest district just got a lot more diverse. Some people are calling it a game changer. Here's Christine Pitawanich. In the Portland Public School District, three positions were up for grabs. Julia Brim Edwards was re-elected, but there were two newcomers, Gary Hollins and Herman Green. I spoke with Brim Edwards on the phone. She called the election historic and groundbreaking. She says for many years, there was only one person of color on the board. And she said on the board of eight, this will be the first time ever there will be three black members. We got a chance to speak with Green about his win. So it's kind of surreal. Um, it's exciting at the same time. I love it. Um, hopeful for what tomorrow is going to look like. He says at first he was telling other people to run for the school board. Then somebody said, you know, you you're doing a whole lot of encouraging other people. Why not you? And then it just clicked and it was like, why not me? Right. And right now, he says it's imperative. There's representation for people of color. They need to be able to see themselves in places where they're going to be making decisions about the, the changes and the transformation that's going to happen within their community. I'm Kelly. I'm a co-founder and executive director of Kairos PDX. The nonprofit does a lot of policy work at the state level and focuses on educational equity and closing achievement gaps for historically underserved kids. And representation matters, uh, period. And so having representation on our school boards, I think, is extremely important, especially given that so much of decisions that impact schools happen at the local level. And when kids see themselves reflected in decision making positions, it can be a game changer. It opens up the world of possibility. It's hard to imagine doing and being something when you never see anyone like you do and be those things. And so at a very young age, as early as sixth grade, seventh grade, you have children canceling out opportunities in their brains because they don't see representation. And so I think it's critical. Now Green is setting his sights on what he can accomplish for his community. It's not, it's not enough that I get in the position. That, that's not enough. What, what matters now is what I do while I'm in the position. While we were unable to talk to Gary Hollins today, we got this statement from him. It says, Portland Public Schools serves a culturally and ethnically rich community, but you wouldn't know it if you look at who works or serves at PPS. We need to make sure PPS reflects who we are across the whole school system, from the boardrooms to the classrooms. I am looking forward to representing all kids who attend Portland Public Schools. Christine Pitawanich, 
KGW News. All right, that's just about it. We're going to be back after the break. I'm going to answer some of your questions, read a few comments. Keep them coming. Use that hashtag, hey, Dan. You can email us at the story at KGW.com. How about this million-dollar lottery? It's interesting. Let me hear what your thoughts are. See you after the break. All right, breaking news tonight. Some sources confirming to our Pat Doris here at KGW that the governor will announce a partnership with the Oregon Lottery to give away a million dollars. They're going to draw from people who have been vaccinated, getting some questions. Steve said, we love the lottery idea. One question, does the state have a database identifying everyone who's been vaccinated? We got ours in Walgreens back in March. Are we eligible? I assume so. I mean, when you get your vaccine, you fill out the information, you put your name down. They, we give you the count every night that the OHA has about how many people in the state of Oregon have been vaccinated. So there are some specific questions, though, that do get interesting, like this one from James. What pool of the vaccinated are being considered for this lottery? What about those of us who are vaccinated outside of the OHA? I got mine through the VA, right? So the VA got its own shipment from the federal government. They weren't going through the OHA. I wonder how that registry works. We should all be eligible. James needs a million too, just as much as the rest of us. If you have questions, keep them coming. Use that hashtag, hey Dan. Uh, of course, there's gonna be more on this announcement in the coming days. The governor has a news conference tomorrow. So I'm sure all these details will come out. But in the meantime, we can think and hope and dream and wish. What am I gonna do with my money? I don't know. Be back in